Well, we've got some big breaking news here at Global Public Affairs, and the headline simply is Paul Whitaker joins Global Public Affairs, and that's saying a lot in a very short sentence. Uh, Paul Whitaker, of course, is extremely well known in Alberta. He is known, in fact, right across the country. But if for any chance you have missed this man's career trajectory, let me help you out. Uh, Paul, for 31 years, was in the Alberta Civil Service and became during that time one of the most respected and certainly one of the most influential and powerful deputy ministers in the Alberta government over a number of administrations. And there was practically nothing that Paul didn't do when he was there. I mean, he was he was with municipal affairs, Aboriginal affairs, intergovernmental affairs. He was with international affairs. He was with the China Alberta Petroleum Center. He was deputy clerk to the cabinet. Uh, he, he was in every job you could possibly imagine that matters in Alberta. He then went to the Alberta Forest Products Association, where he effectively advocated for that sector of the economy for a long time. Paul Whitaker, it is an absolute delight to welcome you uh, to say how thrilled we are that you are with us. But man, with a resume like that, uh, why did you choose global public affairs? Not that it's a bad thing. I think it's the best decision you ever made, by the way. But I'd be interested to hear what you think. Well, th thank you, Simon. First of all, you're, you're too kind in re resetting my background. Y you know, one of the things that always uh, interested me uh, during my time in government, and you, and you gave a great praises of uh, where I was over the years, um, I came into contact with an awful lot of people from the private sector, whether from individual companies themselves or from um, large firms or firms large and small like Global Public Affairs. One of the things that always impressed me about the people uh, with whom I dealt from Global uh, was their professionalism and uh, the way they seemed to inherently understand the issue. And, and one of the things that I think describes my career is I'd like to think of myself as a problem solver. In all of those positions that I held in government over the years, uh, I wasn't reciting the party line, I wasn't reciting uh, chapter and verse from regulations or legislation. I was always trying to seek a solution. And one of the things that strikes me about the, the folks at Global Public Affairs is you share that kind of an orientation. Um, the other thing that really jumps out at me is it's a it's a perfect mix, I think, of uh, people with a great deal of experience, like yourself and, and, and others, uh, and um, and sort of youth and and integrity. And so, what what's fascinating to me is it's a it's a company that has continued to evolve, pull new people in, pull fresh people in, and experienced people as well. And um, and stick to its stick to its vision, its original orientation, its vision. Where's the state of play now in how governments and private sector interact with one another? That that government relations, uh, the, the the industry government dynamic has been fascinating the last year. I think um, we've all come to to develop new terminology. I mean, who knew Zoom existed a year ago? I'm sure some people did, but many of us didn't. And most of us fell back on the tried and true personal connection, personal meeting, sitting in a boardroom, getting to the bottom of things. I think what we've been able to do in the last eight months, nine months, through various digital platforms is continue that connectivity. Sometimes it's difficult. Not everybody is as conversant in the technology. Um, and it, it occasionally is difficult um, in, in terms of reaching the right person. But at the end of the day, um, if you understand how the system works, if you understand uh, who are the key decision makers throughout the system, uh, not just at the political end, but at the senior bureaucracy end, um, life carries on. It's, it's very much uh, business as usual in terms of the content. It's just the format that's different. And so I think we'll come out, as you, as you alluded to, we'll come out of this at the other end in the, in the months to come. Um, but. Um, at the end of the day, I don't think the, the, the process, the thinking has changed that much. It's more just the platform itself. How has government changed in the last 15, 20 years in terms of how it operates, what it's looking for, uh, and, and what motivates government uh, on the inside? I think the, the biggest change probably in the last 15 to 20 years in government is that, and, and it's, and it, it's a bit of a cliche, 
um, to talk about silos, the uh, departments in their own silos. And I think it's I think it's very fair criticism of governments in the past that the ministries tended to be very siloed. They had their bailiwick, uh, they had their regs, they had their legislation, they had their issues, and um, let the other departments do their own thing, let the other ministries do all their own thing, but we have this, we're gonna do this. And while I was in government, I saw that evolve. It took an awful lot of work uh, and it took, it took a constant pressure to understand that the, the <clears throat> interrelated nature of so many issues, especially in the resource sector. Um, you know, you get, you get uh, oil and gas companies, mining companies, forestry companies, all working the same piece of land. Uh, you better come up with solutions to, uh, to regulate activity on that landscape. Uh, and you better figure out how to speak with those industry groups and those companies once instead of four times or 10 times, however ministries have their fingers in it. So I think that to me is the biggest change. And actually the last year and the requirement to sort of adapt to this uh, this digital technology has probably helped that because it's far easier uh, to schedule a one hour video meeting with the 10 most interested parties than it is to try to flip through a calendar and find boardroom time, and find the time when everybody can be in Edmonton in that boardroom at, at noon to do that meeting. So it's actually helped enable uh, the continued, I don't know if this is a term, de uh, that's quite a mouthful, but I think that, that what we've seen has helped hasten that. Tell me what you see, say in a year or two years from now, and what the challenges are gonna be. To me, the, the one issue that jumps out that um, can help both government and uh, the private sector is increased regulatory reform. I think what's what happens over time, um, regulations become cumulative. They, they don't, um, uh, generally speaking, one piece of regulation is not uh, deleted as a new piece comes in. So it tends to be accretive, cumulative. Um, governments haven't done a great job over the years in assessing the regulatory burden that is placed on, on uh, companies. Companies have often not done a great job of conveying that burden uh, or how it can assist them in bouncing back, for instance, from some from an economic challenge like this. But make no mistake, the regulatory regime that companies face uh, bears costs and time. Um, and I saw that in spades in the forestry sector where we were working closely with the government, uh, current government of Alberta to streamline those regulations. And I think they're doing a really strong job right now in focusing on that. Um, but I, I don't, I think we've lost sight of that, that cost driver uh, that is that sort of imposition of regulations. But the companies themselves not only have not done a great job of explaining that burden, um, but it's often the, the, the third leg on the stool is how the public takes this. And regulatory reform should not be seen or should not be conveyed as a way for governments and industry to abdicate their responsibilities, whether it's to the environment or whether it's to broader society. So it, it's it's critical that, that this be focused on, and this I think can help all of us get out of, I mean, it's one of many, many factors obviously, but I think this one jumps out at me as an obvious assist uh, for government, uh, for the economy and for companies going forward. And of course, that's huge in the resource sector, but it brings up an interesting point, and it seems to be the emerging clash of, of ideas when it as pertains to the economy. On the one hand, you have the traditional resource-based economies, not just in Alberta, but in other provinces as well. And then there's this growing sense, uh, this growing power really represented at the moment by the current federal government about the need to sort of reinvent the economy to, to, to green the economy, to meet the Paris Accords or beyond. We see Joe Biden, president-elect in the United States, talking about going well beyond what the Paris Accords said. So how do you see that playing out? It's interesting. I mean, talking first about the resource sector, um, I, I think uh, the resource sector in Canada has long been a driver of, of our economy and, and long been a driver of our export economy. So and to the extent that we're, we are still a, an export focused country, um, I think there, there's still a lot of run in those resource sectors. Uh, I know that um, there's an awful lot of conversation from time to time about the importance of diversifying specifically Alberta's economy, uh, but Canada's economy as well. And 
a couple of a couple of observations on that. One, I think that um, uh, Canada continues to be exceedingly strong in resource areas like forestry and uh, oil and gas and agriculture and mining. Um, and I think we lose sight of the fact that there's a tremendous amount of innovation that can occur in those sectors. So when we talk about the innovation economy, we tend to think of the of the dazzling companies that have done, uh, you know, have had meteoric rise and tremendous growth. But there's an awful lot of innovation that can and should occur in pretty traditional industries. So governments, I think, can have a real hand in helping that kind of innovation as well, as opposed to turning their backs on those, those sectors. Um, the other thing that I think is often overstated is the extent to which government can um, drive that growth. You know, at the end of the day, it's the, it's the individual companies that create those jobs. And what they're looking for, they're looking for uh, a, a degree of certainty. Uh, they're, they're looking for clarity in government decisions. Uh, they're looking for continuity. Um, one, thing that, one thing that's going to kill job creation in this country is, is a yo-yoing between uh, competing policies. And so a degree of certainty out of the federal government and out of provincial governments is imperative going forward. Um, get a plan, stick to it. How do you achieve effective regulatory reform and the type of innovation that you're talking about with sort of a unified message, both on the federal and the provincial planes, when you have this deep and continuing division in the world's most decentralized federation like Canada? <laughs> how, do you, how, do you put, how do you put everybody into, into Humpty's egg uh, and make sure it doesn't fall off the wall? So I spent a lot of my career, as you said, in intergovernmental relations. And one of the frustrations, the reality is that, that virtually all the time, the conversations about uh, the amount of money on the table for policy X or Y and who pays and what the share is going forward. So we all too often simply talk about dollars and cents. and We don't talk about things like best practices. What did frustrate me um, was, and I was in, you know, multiple meetings of first ministers and multiple meetings of ministers. And I'll, I'll, I'll use by way of an example, the healthcare sector. When ministers would meet, um, it was almost always about dollars and cents. <laughs> it was about what was, you know, what, what the costs were. There was very little talk, uh, very little discussion about best practices, sharing of best practices. It strikes me that one of the missing pieces in federal provincial relations in the last 20 years is that ability or willingness to talk about best practices. Ironically, I think governments right now are very focused on how we roll out this vaccine. And so they're actually working together, really focused around best practices. How are we gonna get this out? And in a seamless way, in the best way, and in the fairest way possible. And sadly, that's not the conversation that tends to occur. That's the conversation that needs to occur around so many issues. We can learn from province X might have, have, have built a better mousetrap. Let's learn from them. Province Y might have figured out a way to bend the cost curve. Let's learn from them. Instead, we end up, I think, lecturing each other all too often. Um, and you get, you know, Ontario's health minister in the last week sort of lecturing Alberta's health minister. Not very helpful. Um, it, it, and I, I don't want to sound schmaltzy that we're all in this together. But you know what? We're all in this together. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it, that it almost sort of took a global pandemic to solve some of those federal provincial issues and federal provincial uh, silos, or at least sensibilities that that we had for for so so long. You know, there's a critical role to play uh, for um, the broader society. Um, industry associations are a great aggregator of industry views. Uh, but within those industry associations, there are some great uh, individual companies that have innovated and that have, you know, built that better mousetrap and have an interesting dimension to it. All too often, the conversations that we have around the economic future are very binary. It, it's black, it's white, it's up, it's down. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, it's various shades of gray. It's not black and it's not white. Um, there are a multitude of solutions. Um, we often hear about, for instance, well, we should we should pump money into retraining efforts for for uh, displaced uh, workers. That that's that's great in theory, but I haven't seen it work very well yet anywhere. And so, but, and yet we keep repeating it. We keep repeating um, some of the same sort of terminology, the same solutions that didn't necessarily work 10 years or 20 years ago. 
So part of it's about sort of thinking outside the box. Part of it's about involving the right people in the conversation. And the other part of it is, and, and the right people don't include the same voices over and over again. Um, there is an opportunity to hear a diverse crowd, a, a different set of views. Um, if you keep, you know, the old line about, um, uh, about repeating history over again, those, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. Um, it. It plays out in this situation. If you have the same conversations with the same group of people, shockingly, you have the same kind of outcome. Uh, change the paradigm change the conversation, change the people that are part of the conversation, but also reach out. Paul, on that note, I'm going to conclude this conversation. Uh, we barely scratched the surface, but <laughs> we've hit a few interesting areas that are sort of right in front of us. Uh, once again, uh, we're delighted to have you with us at Global Public Affairs. Really looking forward to your experience and wisdom coming into play, not only for us, but of course, for our, our clients and the people that we're just trying to help. Uh, so Paul Whitaker, welcome. Thanks very much. This has been fun talking to you. Thank you. It's been, it's been great talking to you too, Tom, and I'm delighted to join the team and uh, look forward to uh, jumping in with both feet as soon as possible.